Hi, and welcome to this course on data analytics and machine learning for business and accounting. I'm Mitch Winger, and I'll be guiding our sessions over the next several weeks. My background is in software and business consulting. I began this path with my first job out of college as a consultant for the largest accounting and consulting firm in the world, Arthur Anderson. You may have heard of them. My last job in the commercial sector before entering academia was in the software industry itself with Hyperion Solutions. Hyperion's now part of Oracle Corporation. I've worked with dozens of clients and I've seen quite a bit of change over my career, as you might imagine. One constant I have observed, however, is the increasing ubiquitousness of technology in our businesses and our lives and the constant stream of new unexpected ways that it plays a role in our daily activities. Before jumping into the tools, techniques, and concepts, let's think for a moment just what we mean when we say data analytics. So what are we talking about here? Is it data visualization? Is it data mining? Is it artificial intelligence? whatever that is. In order to think about where we're headed, let's go ahead and take a step back. So if we think about where we've been, well, we started off way back when with what we now call legacy computing. And this uh, dominated from the 1950s uh, all the way through maybe the mid uh, to late 1980s. Here we had big corporate mainframes. We're automating a single business function at a time. More or less, we're focusing on streamlining the paperwork of existing tasks. We're not really thinking about how to do things better. As a result, we ended up with lots of single purpose applications that collected information on just one piece of the business. And we had all these, what we now call data silos or information silos scattered throughout the organization. They didn't, uh, they weren't accessible to other areas of the organization. So the left hand often didn't know what the right hand was doing. So beginning in the 1980s and continuing through the 2000s, we started focusing on what we now call enterprise computing. Hey, we've got all these data silos. Let's see if we can figure out how to put them together, uh, utilize the data organization wide. And we started off in the manufacturing area with uh, materials resource planning, MRP. And then we expanded that into you know, logistics, supply chain, that type of thing, MRP2, and then continued to incorporate other parts of the business uh, up to and including uh, financial accounting, uh, budgeting, planning, reporting, and all that stuff in, into what we call ERPs now, Enterprise Resource Planning System. So at that point, we say, okay, now we've got all this information. We're finally talking throughout the organization, but now we want to take it to the next step. And that's where business intelligence came in. That business intelligence started gaining a foothold in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, and it was uh, highly important through 2010 and beyond. Uh, you still, people are still uh, building their data warehouses. Uh, data warehouses are a big part of intel data business intelligence, data warehouses and the tools associated with them. OLAP, online analytic processing. Uh, that's basically a specialized multidimensional database that allows you to um, slice and dice. Uh, that's actually the industry term. Uh, basically pivot and review data from different dimensions very quickly. If you've ever worked with pivot tables in Excel or Power Pivot, uh, uh, Power BI, Tableau, things like that, you have worked with an OLAP engine. Uh, all those tools have some kind of an OLAP engine to help you slice and dice that data very quickly. KPIs, key performance indicators, executive dashboards, uh, and then growing into dashboards throughout the organization. Uh, concepts like the balanced scorecard methodologies uh, like that, and the performance prism and other related uh, approaches to looking at financial and non-financial 
data. But throughout all this time, almost all the data available is some kind of structured transactional data. So that leads us into where we're headed. Uh, and of course, we've been doing this for a while, but we just continue to find new ways to uh, utilize data. And that's with data analytics. Early 2000s uh, up until uh, now and beyond, we're looking at machine learning. We're looking at automating uh, decisions, those that uh, take place thousands of times a day and automating the identification and maybe even the decision-making process for new decisions. AI, and probably most importantly, big data, and more importantly than big data, the many, many types of data that are out there. Uh, we've gone way beyond just uh, structured transactional data, and now we've got textual data, whether it be Twitter feeds, product reviews on Amazon, Facebook, email, uh, those can all be analyzed fairly effectively. Video and audio, uh, pictures, uh, all that different type of data now can come together. Sensor data, GPS data, all these types of things come together now um, and can be analyzed using the variety of tools that are out there. So, what kind of skills do we need? Well, if you look at analyzing data, uh, it's as old as uh, information in general. So since we've begun collecting information, we've found ways to summarize it, make sense of it, and often through visualization. So this here is a famous visualization uh, you can think about military strategists uh, maybe outlining what they wanted to do or, or reviewing what has happened on a map. Uh, we've probably seen things like that in movies. Uh, you may have done something like that if you ever played uh, football in the uh, playground uh, or in the park. You may have drawn up a play in the dirt. Similar concept. So here we can see a visualization of Napoleon's march on Moscow. You know, one of the neat things about this is you can actually overlay this on a map of Europe and it's geographically accurate uh, pretty much uh, as far as uh, what happened. So you can see the advance on Moscow in the brownish uh, band and the retreat in the black band. So you can tell a pretty rich detailed story about this conflict with one good visualization. So you can see down there, we've got temperatures on various days along the way. So there's a lot of information packed in here. And here's where we, you know, we've heard the trope, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And, if, and indeed, we can tell many, many stories uh, with a simple data visualization like this. So again, what kind of skills do we need to develop something like this? I probably wouldn't be able to do it myself. So what skills contribute to this? So we've got a modern subject, data analytics, but we're drawing from lots of different reference disciplines. Math, obviously, is one that probably pops into your head right away. You know, we've got all kinds of things like stats, averages, uh, different calculations, residuals, uh, distances that we're going to be using to summarize data and to review and analyze the data. So we don't necessarily all become expert mathematicians, but we do want to have some basic mathematical understanding of what's going on and be passingly familiar with the concepts in use. Same thing with logic. We don't have to be, you know, logicians or philosophers on logic, but you want to be able to make sense of, manipulate data appropriately. You want to have some kind of understanding of logic, and in particular, Boolean logic, ands and ors. The, these are going to become important as you as you work with and manipulate your data, wrangle the data, try and get it to. Uh, some kind of a format that you can uh, apply your techniques and develop some understanding from it. Next, science. So we're going to develop some, uh, draw some influences from the field of science. You all probably learned about the scientific method 
uh, the basic scientific method when you're um, in school growing up. We've got some kind of a theory that we can create some hypotheses or predictions from. We develop some kind of a an experiment to test that hypothesis and draw some conclusions. So this is certainly one way we can use the scientific approach in data analytics. We also use another scientific approach in data analytics. Uh, that one we just described uses uh, deduction or hypothetical deductive logic. Uh, we could also use inductive logic and often do in data analytics. Um, uh, and so we want to see if the data tells us anything that we can make some use of. So do we have some kind of an experiment that we're working with, or do we have some data that we want to draw some inferences from? Computation. So much of what we're going to do has all kinds of uh, computations, algorithms built right in. Of course, the computer will do that for us, just like we use Excel now to calculate things that used to take a room full of accountants uh, and a 17 column worksheet to calculate. So we build on uh, the, you know, stand on the shoulders of people uh, that have developed tools and techniques and technology for us and move things forward. One you may not have thought of is design. So it's great if we can find these stories in our data, but we also need to be able to present the stories effectively. So we'll be making graphs, charts, figures, using different tools. And I know I've seen some badly designed visuals, graphs, charts, etc. You probably have as well. So you probably know exactly what I mean when I say, you know, we want to learn and take some insights from the field of design. Now, fortunately, tools like Tableau and even Excel and Power BI now have some pretty good design fundamentals built right into their defaults. Excel didn't used to be the case, and you could build something real ugly in a hurry with Excel back in the day, uh, but Excel has uh, grown by leaps and bounds and gotten a lot better at giving you a default that actually looks passable. So we want good design, good visuals that tell our story uh, without any seeming effort on our part as we present to our audience. Another area, how about philosophy? Might seem like a strange one, but it kind of is related to the logic we talked about before. How do we know what's true? How do we know what causes what? So it goes along with that scientific method as well. And of course, these are old questions that have been around uh, for thousands of years, even uh, predating the scientific method as we know it today. So we want to take some of these philosophical lessons and move forward with them to help understand and tell the right story. Art, uh, again, you can get back to the, that uh, Napoleon map graph. So art, highly related to design, but uh, there are actually uh, in big data analytics uh, teams of artists that are employed to help present and develop the final products. So being able to put things together aesthetically pleasing, um, going beyond just the technical information can be a big part of it. And of course, you know, there may be more. So We've drawn all kinds of different fields. Uh, we may find some others to draw on, or you may think of some others that make sense as we work forward through this course. All right, so one term you're going to hear or probably have already heard and certainly will if you read a lot about data analytics and you hear the term in other fields as well, is something called a unicorn. So what is a unicorn? Well, a unicorn is the rare professional who is exceedingly strong in all of the core areas required for a particular practice area. So if you think about data analytics, you'll see lots of different descriptions of what a unicorn is, but uh, we'll take a look at a couple examples here. So Mark Keith uh, describes it like this. We've got our subject matter experts. These are the ones that understand the domain of the problem to be solved. Well, you know, it's some kind of a business process. It's an industry, healthcare, natural sciences, whatever. 
we've got the mathematical and statistical expertise to understand the various algorithms and uh, analyses that are used, when they should be used, when they shouldn't be used, what roles they play, and so forth. And then the computer science abilities, the technical expertise to be able to deploy the findings to help make decisions. Okay? And then you can see in uh, the borders there, we've got um, the overlaps. So research is the overlap between subject matter expert and math and statistics. And this is uh, what you would commonly see in academic researchers. Academic PhDs tend to have some expertise in their field of study, whether it be accounting or real estate or psychology. And then they have the mathematical and statistical wherewithal to be able to perform studies in that field. Same thing with software engineering, combining our general subject matter, business knowledge, and technology knowledge to get solutions for business processes out in the field, and machine learning, where we're mixing the computer science with the math and stats. Now, if you've seen the Rapid Miner videos, and you'll have an opportunity to see some going forward, I'm sure, you'll probably run across Ingo's very, very exaggerated definition of the unicorn, uh, which is uh, an expert in every possible type of business problem in all industries and processes. Also a PhD in stats and all advanced mathematics, knows everything about every mathematical theorem. And he or she is also a superstar software engineer can uh, code in any coding language and can work on any platform out there. So this is an exaggeration that makes a point. Yeah, it'd be great if you could find someone that is all three of those, but you probably won't. They're exceedingly rare. And those that are already out there are probably employed by Google or Amazon or a company like that anyway. But the idea is we want to see if we can expand from one area of expertise into others. Here's one that I got when I was at a consortium a while back with one of the big four, where we want to have our business analysts, and again, that's going to be where you and I fit in for the most part, business expertise, but we want to have crossover knowledge in these other skill areas. We want to be able to talk to the analytic architects that are back in New York or wherever the analytic team happens to be, the analytic modelers that are working with models uh, that can deal with the types of data we're going to run across in our engagements. So these crossover competencies, and, and some of you may end up uh, working exclusively on one of those core data analytic teams in the headquarter office. So, so that is definitely a valid career path. Uh, all, others of you will utilize the knowledge you have in those crossover areas uh, to help with your specific engagement responsibilities. So when we think about all these crossover competencies and, and being able to work together with the three different skill sets, that's what we mean when we say the analytics mindset. All right, so that's it for our brief intro to data analytics. I hope you found this video useful be sure to check out the other videos in our series.